Good day everyone, welcome to lesson 104, Three World Ages and the End of the World. Lots of attention getter, isn't it? I hope you all enjoy this very serious study. Before we begin, as always, we ask for a word of wisdom, understanding, and discernment. In Jesus Christ's precious name, Amen. Three World Ages and the End of the World. Why even study this topic? Because an understanding of the Bible's three world ages is a key to understanding God's plan and many of our most intriguing questions about it. For instance, why are we here? How old is God's creation? What does the Bible mean in Hebrews by multiple worlds? Does the world, meaning our planet, end at Christ's return? Now, world, the word in English, has two very distinct meanings in the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Of the 241 times in the New Testament you see the word world, it's translated from one of two Greek words. Either Greek 2889, that's the strongest concordance number, cosmos, which refers to the physical world and its inhabitants. But there's another word in the original Greek manuscripts that's translated into world in English. And that's Greek 165 in your strongest concordance, aion, and that's where we get the word eon. And it refers to the world as an age of time, by extension, perpetuity, a period of time present or future or even past. So in the original Greek manuscripts, as we just stated, world can refer to the physical world and its inhabitants or a period and age of time. Now this distinction changes the meaning of a verse in modern English, as you can imagine. Before we go on, though, I listed 241 times in the New Testament that we see the word world. It's translated from one of these two words. Well, there is a 242nd occurrence. Quick exception alert before I get lots of emails about this. There is one place in the New Testament, Revelation 13.3, where world is not translated either from Achion or Cosmos. It is translated from Greek 10.93, which is ge, G-E. And that's where we get the prefix geo, we get the, the words geology and geography, geometry, etc., things that pertain to the earth. In every other instance in the New Testament, though, that the word, the Greek word, ge, is used, it's translated as earth. So it is a little different. So Revelation 13.3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world, in this case it's ge, wondered after the beast. So in that verse, to fit with the pattern of which scripture was translated, that word world is best read as earth. It doesn't really change the meaning of that verse at all, but just for our study, we're, we're focusing on the word world as it is translated from both Ahion and Cosmos, which it is the other 241 times. All right, got that exception out of the way. Maybe that'll prevent those emails. So, the word world, when translated from Cosmos, has a very instinctive interpretation. So let's look at it use in scripture of world as ahion, which is an age of time. In other words, we think of the word world as the physical world and the, the things around us, so that's not hard for us to wrap our mind around. But this alternative definition of world as an age of time, let's look at how that affects the meaning of God's word when we put it into context. Quick note, always remember that God is the author of scripture and he does not make mistakes. Rightly divided, scripture does interpret itself. Man, however, often through ignorance or prideful arrogance, does make mistakes. Whether through willful deception or through misinterpretation or mistranslation, these mistakes can pile up over time to become traditions of men that make void the word of God. And I put an analogy, it's a bit like playing the phone game with scripture. If you've ever played the phone game when you were a kid, you start with a sentence, a phrase, or a rumor, or a story at one end of the room, and everyone has to whisper it to each other, and by the time it gets to the end, no one recognizes 
what was said. And it can be that way when you let man handle scripture over generation after generation. In his word, God reveals to us that the plan for his children includes three world and heaven ages. Now, if this is new to you, stay with me. The world in the world ages refers to the physical creation that we can see and hear when we're in the flesh. Everything that you can touch, everything tangible. The heaven in the heaven ages refers to the spiritual creation that we can't see when we're in our flesh bodies. It's, the, it's extra dimensional from our point of view. When we're in the flesh as we are now, we cannot see that part of God's creation. Now, after Satan's rebellion, in which a third of God's children participated, God chose not to destroy his children as punishment. But through this sin, through rebellion, which is what sin means, we have been temporarily removed from God's physical presence. By that I mean we cannot experience him face to face physically when we're limited in the flesh. Of course he can experience us. He can experience all of his creation. We have been temporarily removed from God's physical presence so that we may choose either salvation through Jesus Christ or perdition, which means destruction, through Satan. Those of us in the book of life will be eternally reunited with our Father through Christ. And how wonderful that will be. That just gives a little background about why there was an, a heaven and an earth age before ours. That's when Satan's rebellion took place. But we'll get into it in scripture. And here we are. The three world ages as detailed in 2 Peter. And there are the verses we're going to cover. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. This first four verses we're going to cover a little quicker because it doesn't really get into the meat of our discussion, but I always hate to start Scripture out of context. Verse 1, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And aren't we surrounded by them right now? And they will be saying and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So in the last days there are scoffers walking and mocking. Oh, Where is Jesus? Where is the promise of his coming? And they mock us. And this reminds me of when I was very, very young, when I was in grade school, I saw a news commentator on television very quickly, and he was mocking Christianity by saying, look folks, it's been 2,000 years, the guy's not coming back. And then he chuckled. And that, this verse always reminds me of that. I was very upset by that comment even as a boy, and even more so now. But those are the scoffers. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So God's plan is going to come to pass exactly as it is written. When things look bleak, don't worry. When you see the scoffers, don't worry. The victory's already been won. It is finished. The kingdom is at hand. We just have a little patient wait. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So for this, people are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Of old is referring to an age before this one. Verse 6. Whereby the world that then was of old in the previous age, being overflowed with water, perished. Now many people make a mistake and they think this refers to Noah's flood. But let's look at this verse closely. In this verse, the word world, which is the focus of our study, is cosmos. That's that physical world. So the physical world that then was, of old, in a previous age, perished. Now this word perished, in your strongest concordance, is Greek 622. It's a polemy, and it means to destroy fully, to completely obliterate. There is no life left. That word is very close-ended very close meaning in the Greek. Okay, It's not open to interpretation. There was nothing left. 
So cosmos in this verse means the world and its inhabitants. And in this flood, all the world's inhabitants perished. Is this Noah's flood then? It can't be if all perished. For we know Noah and his family and the animals that they, they needed were all saved in the ark. It's further evidence that this first global flood of old is in the previous world age. God promised never again after two floods. You remember in Noah's flood, he gave us the rainbow as the sign of his promise that he would never again destroy the life on earth through a flood. But why would he do that if he only did it once? He didn't give us a sign after he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The reason he did that is because he had brought that flood upon his children twice. And to prevent us from being afraid about it, he reassures us that it won't happen again. Why did he use the flood the second time? Well, for those of you very familiar with Genesis chapter 6 and the sons of God and the daughters of men, you understand that God was sending a message to a particular group of people. Remember, I destroyed the world this way once. I'm doing it again. Stop tinkering with my plan. That's for another study. So this flood in the fr that was of old, that then was, in which all life perished, this flood marked the end of the first world age. You can read of it also in Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27, which is where we're going to turn to now, and we'll come back to 2 Peter after that. Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27. It's always nice to have synchronicity between an event in the New Testament and the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. God's word is unchanging. It always comes to pass as it is written. It's nice to have an event in Hebrew and an event in Greek and have them coincide across two languages and across hundreds, in some case thousands of years. So let's look at this first flood in the first world age in Jeremiah. This flood was as, this was God's reaction to Satan's rebellion. Verse 23, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. Does that sound familiar? The Genesis 1-2? Don't forget that. Put it on a shelf because in another study called In the Beginning, you'll understand why it uses those same words. So let's start over. So God comes to the earth after the rebellion. He beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. No man, not some, not a few, not Noah and his family, no man. This is not an interpretation. This is not reading into it. It's what it says. Verse 26. I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. That's as a result of the war that was the rebellion. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So there were cities and civilizations in the first earth age. Remember that. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate. The whole land shall be desolate. No life left. Yet will I not make a full end. So again, even though his reaction at the end of this rebellion in the first world age was very angry and he destroyed life on earth in a global flood he made this commitment this won't be the end I'm not going to judge my children because they were beguiled by Satan we're going to give them a chance in a second world age so let's go back to 2nd Peter and see how that fits 2nd Peter 3 7 but the heavens and the earth which are now so we've transitioned from of old to which are now so we're now in our current second world age. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And perdition means destruction. So which are now, again, that puts us in our current second world age. And note that heaven and earth are kept separate in these verses knowing that heaven is to be in the physical presence of God. That's the definition of heaven, uh, spiritually, is to be in the physical presence of God. 
We can see neither God nor that which is of heaven when we're in our flesh bodies. You can see scripture there that discusses that. Only at Christ's return, when we are all instantly transformed to our spiritual bodies, will we see the spiritual realm again. And more scripture that discusses that. We're going to come back into this fire on the day of judgment because a lot of this frightens a lot of people when it talks about when it talks about the heavens and the earth and fire and judgment. Verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years implied with man. And a thousand years implied with man is as one day with the Lord. Now this is really important, not just for this study, but for other studies when you look at creation. Time is relative to our experience. It passes much slower for those in the heavenly realm than it does for those of us in mortal flesh bodies. Just think of it. Your soul is eternal. Eternal. We, we can't even wrap our minds around that. And eternal in the Greek, if you look it up, it means forever backwards and forwards. Our soul has always existed. Even though we are, are currently ignorant of things before we were born in the flesh, your soul is eternal. Put that into perspective to your flesh body, which if you're extremely lucky, you'll live 120 years. That's not even the blink of an eye in spiritual time. Compared to an eternity, how long is 120 years? It's nothing. Science is just beginning to understand that time is relative. Now think about that. If you were born in, let's say, the middle of the 1500s in Europe, and there's a clock tower at the church, and it keeps time. You think of time as being absolute and unchanging. The seconds always pass at the same speed. The minutes always pass at the same speed. Noon today is the same as noon tomorrow. It's unwavering. But scripture tells us that time is relative. For centuries man thought this, that time was absolute. How could this truth be in scripture, that time is relative, if it were not written by God? God's wisdom is evident in this truth that is completely contrary to the observations of man. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this verse again connects the concept of the three world ages as a result of the rebellion in the first world age. So even though a third of God's children join Satan in that rebellion, he doesn't want any of his children to perish. He wants us all to come to repentance. So he's giving this one and only chance to us in the flesh. God didn't want to destroy the third of his children that participated in Satan's rebellion. So this world age was created so that all his children can be born in the flesh one time and regain everlasting life through Christ Jesus. This is a little side note whenever you're studying scripture. There's much opposite symmetry in scripture regarding Satan and Christ. As we were physically separated from our father because of Satan's rebellion, we will be reunited with him through Christ Jesus by being found in the book of life. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now this verse scares a lot of people, so let's stick with this for just a moment. The day of the Lord. Well, we just learned a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, so don't think of it as a 24-hour period. It's a very long, the Lord's day is a very long period of time. Revelation chapter 20 refers to it as a thousand years. It could, remember too, that very large numbers were difficult to represent in classical languages. So just think of it as a day with the Lord is a lot longer than a 24-hour day that we experience. Now about the judgment. There is no reason to fear judgment for those of us that are saved. God's judgment is a refining fire, like a blacksmith's fire which provides eternal life to the righteous. There are scripture to read about that. 
but it is a consuming fire, eternal death in the lake of fire to the unrighteous. And there are verses for you to look at that. So don't be afraid of, of God's judgment. Because at God's judgment, everyone gets their due, good or bad. Now, one more thing in this, um, where it says, the heaven shall pass away with a great noise. You can think of that as the veil between ourselves and heaven. We can't see heaven right now. That veil passes away, and we are once again reunited with the heavenly realm when we are transformed back into our spiritual bodies, as we already showed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So in other words, all of these things that we take so seriously in the flesh, they're all going to dissolve away when we're transformed and back into our spiritual bodies. So don't let the temporary nature of this world and its pleasures affect your priorities. Concern yourself rather with your treasures in heaven. Of course, some very famous verses for you to look at there regarding that. This doesn't mean ignore your flesh body and your flesh life. It's very important. The decisions you make in this life will affect you for all eternity. So take care of your body, take care of your family. Just get your priorities straight. This age, our current age, the second world age, will end at judgment and all will be reset according to your salvation and your works. Your very role in heaven is determined by your works while here in the flesh. Choose your priorities accordingly. I know it's a little bit unpopular to talk about works versus grace, but this is the analogy I always use. There are no works we can commit that can save our soul. That goes without saying. The only path to salvation, the only door you can pass through for salvation is Jesus Christ. No two ways about it. Once you've passed through that door, though, once you've entered the kingdom, your works are judged and your role is according to those at the time of judgment. And there are verses for you to study. Of course, John 3.16 refers to salvation being through Christ Jesus. But once you are have that salvation, our works become very important. That salvation should manifest itself in your works. Isn't that what bearing fruit is all about? Verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now see, the, the imagery there of the refining fire is very evident. The element of the, the, the slag is melted away and the pureness of your soul is, is left unblemished through the fire of God's judgment if you're saved. That refining fire is something to be looked forward to for those of us who are to be saved. It's not something to be feared. And the heavens being on fire and shall be dissolved again it's a reference to all the barriers that separate us from that spiritual realm from the rest of God's creation that we can't experience at the moment are dissolved away when in the blink of an eye to Christ's return we are transformed back into our spiritual bodies verse 13 nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness the third world age. So, in the first earth and heaven age, we were together with God. We could see the spiritual realm, the spiritual creation. Because of Satan's rebellion, God cho chose not to destroy his children. We were put in this flesh. We were physically separated from God, even though he is not separated from us. So that we can choose salvation or perdition. But at the new heaven and new earth, at the third world and heaven age, we're reunited again. The third and final world heaven age, just as the first world age went on eternally backward, so will the third world age go on eternally forward. That's our eternal life. There is so much symmetry in God's word, and the more you study it, the more you see that. I'm not talking about secret codes or gobbledygook. There's just a lot of structural symmetry to God's plan. Uh, dwelleth righteousness. 
That's a really important term that people pass over. In that new heaven and new earth, in that third earth and, and heaven age, the unrighteous have suffered the second death at the lake of fire. Judgment has already passed. There's no longer sin, and we are no longer in flesh bodies, and that's why nothing dwells there but righteousness. This verse, this new heaven and new earth, does not synchronize with God's word if the new earth refers to an actual physical planet rather than an age of time. Now we finished with Second Peter. Two things before we continue. There was a world age before this one for billions of years that preceded the global flood that we studied in Second Peter 3 and Jeremiah 4. Don't let God's beautiful, evident creation, the fossils, the geological formations, the dinosaur skeletons, the majesty of the universe, the beauty of the universe, don't let those things be a stumbling block to your salvation. And don't let them be a stumbling block to your witnessing to people who have questions. For it is man's ignorance, not God's word, that all creation is approximately 6,000 years old. The man, Adam, that one particular man, was created about 6,000 years ago. We should not be so arrogantly prideful as to put the creation of our temporary and perishable flesh bodies at the center of all God's grand creation. And if some of this seems unfamiliar to you, uh, there will be a subsequent study at the time of this filming. I haven't filmed it yet. But it will be called In the Beginning, and it will cover the chronology of God's creation in greater detail from biblical perspective, not my opinion. Second thing to remember, the fact that there are three world heaven ages does not mean we are born, mul born multiple times. We are not talking about reincarnation, which is a belief that is in opposition to scripture. We have one eternal, spiritual, incorruptible body, which currently resides within our one perishable flesh body. Our spiritual and flesh bodies are only ever born once. And the, if you think of, the Bible refers to the first resurrection, the second resurrection, the first death, the second death. Our flesh bodies will perish, but our spiritual bodies will go on eternally unless we are judged to perdition at judgment. Which, of course, none of us are going to be because we love our Father and we accept Jesus Christ. If you're still not convinced there are three world ages, as referred to in the Bible, let's continue to look at what God's word has to say about world as an age of time, rather than as a place. This will also cover, what's this end of the world business in the New Testament? Now from this point on, I could, it's because you're a little familiar with the fact that we're discussing world as both ahion, a period of time, and as cosmos, the physical world around us. I'm color coding them. So from now on, whenever we read a verse, if it's in light blue, like this is, that refers to ahion, a period of time or an age of time. If it is in green, then it refers to cosmos, the world around us. So let's turn to Matthew 12, 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, neither in the world to come. On both instances, because you could see it's in blue, that word world is from ahion, a period of time, an age of time. So neither in this age, the second age, nor in the third earth world age, will it be forgiven to speak against the Holy Spirit. So the only unforgivable sin listed in the Bible is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. By indicating it is unforgivable in both this age and the next, Christ is emphasizing that this is a blemish which cannot be erased. I put, a, uh, put in parentheses here, this next part is my, although informed, it's my opinion. I can't give you a verse that says this exactly. But I feel that this reference and every reference to the unforgivable sin of speaking against the Holy Spirit, this reference may also point to the time frame during which this sin can be committed. Because it's at the joining of this age and the next age, it points to the tribulation of Antichrist, which is the bridge between those two ages. The period that marks the beginning of the end for this world age and is about to usher in the next world age when Christ returns. Why do I say that? I think 
looking at the Bible, the only time that you can speak against the Holy Spirit is if you are brought up before the tribulation of Antichrist, as in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. When you, if you are brought up before the synagogue of Satan, you are supposed to allow the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, to speak through you. It's my opinion that not doing so, refusing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that is speaking against the Holy Spirit. Again, a little bit, that's my opinion, but I can't see any other reference or context in Scripture in which you could speak against the Holy Spirit. And I do think it's important where here we see that it's mentioned in this time frame of the link between the current second world age and the to come third world age. Christ's explanation of the parable of the tares is often misunderstood and misinterpreted because of a lack of understanding of world as a period of time. Let's look at his explanation with this distinction in mind. And remember, cosmos will be in green, Achion will be in blue. So Matthew 13, 38 through 40, Christ's explanation. The field is the world. So that's cosmos, the world around us. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Look, world is Achion. It's a period of time. It's the end of this age. The harvest is the end of this age, not the end of the planet. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world age. Because again, it's Achion. It, it's always interesting to me when I see some preachers, when they discuss the parable of the sower, the parable of the tares, etc. They always like to give their interpretation as if God chose them to be some footnote to scripture. Christ himself interprets these parables for us. So the field is the world around us and the harvest is at the end of this age and those tares are gathered and burned in the fire, in the lake of fire at the end of this age. Bolsters everything we've talked about and again, this is not my interpretation. These words of world, whether it be cosmos or achion, that's the way they appear in scripture. Matthew 13:49 another mention of end of the world. So shall it be at the end of the world, the age, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. And this is very important. Every scriptural reference to quote end of the world refers to the end of the second world age at Christ's return. It refers to Achion, not Cosmos. Every single instance it is not a cataclysmic destruction of our planet. Please don't be fooled, scared, or frightened by weak preachers. Rightly divide your Father's word. This is what the scripture says. End of the world is the end of this age, not the planet. Let's look at examples of world as an age in Hebrews. Well, this is also where we see the multiple worlds. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds, the ages, first, second, and third. So you see it's not talking about multiple planets, multiple earths. It's just talking about the, the three earth ages. Hebrews 11.3 Through faith, we understand that the world ages, it's Achion, were framed by the word of God. So his word frames those ages, and it does. We discussed it already. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now that's very confusing if you don't understand world as an age of time. And what it's referring to is the things that we see now, the Grand Canyon, the fossils, the dinosaurs, the, the size and the expansion of the universe, those things were not put in place, were not created in this age that we experience. They're not 6,000 years old. They're older than that. Hebrews 9.26 For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now that is cosmos, since the foundation of the world and its inhabitants. 
But now once in the end of the world, age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Further examples of world as age of time. The world without end of Ephesians. Ephesians 3.21 Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So it's very evident, even if you're not familiar with this cosmos versus ahion uh, wording, it's very evident in this verse that we're talking about an age of time. It says throughout all ages, world without end, without time without end. And in this instance, the word ages that we see in that verse is from Strong's Concordance, Greek 1074, genia. And of course, it means generations, and that's where we get our word generation. So throughout all generations, ages without end, time without end, amen. Now the world without end phrase in the original manuscripts, it doesn't actually say world without end. In the ancient Greek, it just has achion twice. It says achion, achion. And the repetition of the word changes the meaning in the ancient Greek from one age of time to all ages, to unending time. You can think of it when you hear kids playing games back and forth and one of them will come up with infinity times infinity. That's what that makes me think of. Achion, achion, unending time. In conclusion... Let's look back at the questions that we started with. Why are we here in the flesh and in this world age? Through sin, rebellion. We were physically separated from God at the end of the first world age, but through Christ Jesus, by his sacrifice, and at his return at the end of this second world age, we will be transformed back into our spiritual bodies and reunited with our Father for all eternity. And remembering that the spiritual definition of heaven to be in the presence of God. To be reunited with God is to be in heaven. How old is God's creation? Is it 6,000 years old? No. We are currently in the second world age, which began some time after God's first great flood that we studied destroyed all life after Satan's rebellion. The first earth age existed for billions of years prior. Adam, that man, the bloodline through whom salvation would enter the world in Jesus Christ was created approximately 6,000 years ago. Let's pause for a moment. Scripture tells us that Adam is the first husbandman. He's the first commercial farmer that God creates. There is historical and geographical correlation in science between modern man's arrival and that of commercial farming, which made all civilization possible don't overlook that. If you go back and look at about 6,000 years ago, we see the plow, the first viable plow emerge somewhere in the Middle East around the Fertile Crescent, and we see the evidence of commercial farming emerging at the same time in that Fertile Crescent. Where was Eden? In that Fertile Crescent. Where was Adam? In that Fertile Crescent. What's so important about commercial farming? Without the surplus created by commercial farming, you can't have that extra food that allows people to specialize in other trades. Everyone's too busy trying to eat and survive. So it's because of commercial farming that we get written language, organized, structured religion, or organized, there, there was religion before that, but not in the way that we see it now. And also organized, structured, civil societies with a government, with a central government. But don't look for a disagreement where there isn't one. God's creation is billions of years old. Yes, Adam was made about 6,000 years ago, and that correlates with the geographical and historical evidence. God's creation, as we said, is much older than that. Civilizations, this is important, civilizations existed in the first world age. Remember Jeremiah 4 talked about the cities? Which also agrees with archaeological evidence. Now stop for just a moment. Think of this. In the first world age, there were civilizations. There were cities, there were governments, there was architecture, and we know this. Just a couple of examples. In the ocean off the coast of Japan and in the ocean off the coast of India are submerged pyramids of obviously human construction. 
and they baffle scientists because we know civilization is supposed to not have existed past about 6,000 years ago. Yet these pyramids, based on the ocean levels, had to have been built tens of thousands, if not longer, years ago. They don't fit. There's lots of examples of civilization architecture being found that doesn't correlate with the idea that civilization only started 6,000 years ago. Why? Because we know, in God's word, there was civilization in the first world age, and God destroyed it all and started over and put us in the flesh. Again, for more on, I didn't mean to deviate so much, for more on the chronology of God's creation from a biblical point of view, look for the study in the beginning. What does the Bible mean in Hebrews by multiple worlds? Well, this one is easy. I mean, you don't even need me to explain it now that you know these references are to world as achion, not cosmos, and so it's referring to ages of time, not our physical planet. Does the physical world, the earth, end at Christ's return? No. Remember, every mention of the end of the world in Scripture is referring to the end of the second world age at Christ's return. That's not my interpretation. It says achion, not cosmos. His return is a time for celebration. It's the marriage feast. It's not the planet blowing up. We should be excited and happy. There are some verses regarding that. Look forward to that time. Don't fear it. And don't let weak preachers put fear in you and scare you. A lot of them like... I shouldn't say that. Forgive me. Some bad preachers like to scare people, so they send in their checks. Don't be scared. For so long as you love our Father, accept His Word and His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, and let this love manifest itself through your works. It will be a time of great joy and happiness. It's something to look forward to. Don't be scared. Study God's Word. Stay in His Word. Show Him you love Him. Accept Jesus Christ and let it show in your works. Let it bear fruit. Thank you for joining me for this study. Have a wonderful day. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining me in this Bible study. We make God's day when we show Him our love through the study of His Word. These studies are brought to you by your donations. If they help you, please help me to keep bringing them to you. Remember, your Father loves you. Show Him your love every day and in every way. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Godspeed and God bless.